Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Orbit Live event. Uh, this is part of our How to Write Your First SFF Novel series, and today's topic is how to structure a scene. Uh, we've brought together four authors of science fiction and fantasy, uh, whose books I am a fan of. So this was a particularly fun panel to put together, talking about different kinds of scenes. So we have Alexander Darwin, uh, who is going to be talking about fight scenes, among other things. You don't have to stick to just those okay. topics. Uh, Georgia Summers will be talking about death scenes, Kimberly Lemming talking about sex scenes, and Heather Fawcett will be talking about scenes in an epistolary novel. Uh, so before we get started, just a note about Crowdcast and the series. If you click on the button on the right side of your screen with a question mark, that's the Q&A. You can enter your questions there. After we go through some of my questions for the authors, we'll start answering your questions. You can also vote on other people's questions, and we'll start with the top voted ones. You can click on the green button at the bottom of your screen to sign up for more sessions in the series. There's actually one more, uh, and then we'll be done. There's one more tomorrow, which is about uh, what to do if you need more words. But you can also watch the replays of all the previous events. There are 12 others, and they are lots of fun. So let me start by introducing our authors briefly. Uh, Heather Fawcett is the author of Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies and its upcoming sequel, Emily Wilde's Map of the Otherlands. Georgia Summers is the author of The City of Stardust, which will be out from Red Hook in January 2024. Kimberly Lemming is the author of the Mead Mishap series, which begins with That Time I Got Drunk and Saved a Demon, uh, which is out now in ebook and will be out in paperback also in January of 2024. And Alexander Darwin is the author of The Combat Codes and its upcoming sequel, Grievar's Blood, which I believe is out next month. That's, that's coming up quite soon, huh? So I'd like to start by asking each of you to give us a quick pitch of your book or series. Uh, this is this is not does not necessarily need to relate to the topic of today's panel, but just to give everyone an idea of what kind of books you're writing. Uh, so let's start. I'm going to go in the order you all are on my screen. Let's start with Alex. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. Excited to do this. Uh, my book uh, is the call of the combat codes. Actually, I have, a, I have a copy handy right here. It's about a world where uh, single combat duels have replaced wars between nations. Um, and yes, the second book is out next month right up here. Okay, Georgia, how about you? Hi, um, so the city of Stardust starts with the Everly family who are cursed uh, by this powerful immortal woman. Um, and so 10 years ago, Marianne Everly goes off to try and went off to try and break this curse and never came back. So now her daughter must go ahead and find her mother to try and break the curse or else take her place. And so she travels across our world. She deals with powerful scholars, um, vengeful gods and sort of these really terrifying monsters um, and eventually crosses over into another world um, to find the lost city of Stardust. Kim, over to you. Well, my book, That Time I Got Drunk and Saved the Demon, is about if you could guess, a woman that gets drunk and saves a demon. She's super excited because her whole village had just uh, chosen their goddess's chosen hero, and she was not picked. And she's so happy about it. But plot twist, a demon shows up to drag her along on a different dangerous quest, and she's not too pleased about it. But he does keep burning off his shirt. So, you know, that's a plus. And Heather. Yeah, so Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies is the first book in what is currently going to be a three book series. It is an epistolary, historical fantasy, cozy fantasy, light academia. There's a lot of categories it fits into. And it's set in a world where fairies are kind of a proven scientific reality. And they're this group, there's this group of people who study them called dryadologists, and Emily Wilde is one. And it just kind of follows her adventures through investigating different fairy mysteries. Great. All right, let's jump right into talking about scenes. What are the essential elements of a scene? Does it have more to do with the length, uh, with the amount of action that takes place, with advancing the story? Let's go in reverse of the order we just went. So Heather, why don't we start out with you? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think that the only real essential element of a scene, in my opinion, is that it should move the plot forward in some way. Um, however, I do, and maybe this is a controversial take, but I actually think that in fantasy and sci-fi, you can have scenes that are mostly just there for world building. You know, I've seen authors do that, and as long as it's, I think, done sparingly, it's a 
okay. Um, I personally prefer for each scene slash chapter slash entry in a journal, whatever I'm working on, to advance this, the story in some way. Um, but I do think that it's, you know, storytelling is a form of art, and I don't think there should necessarily be rigid rules, but that's my personal preference when I'm writing. Kim, how about you? I usually have scenes as setups to whatever joke I'm trying to tell. I'll sit there and put together a whole dragon fight just to make a joke about cheese. So to me, it's all about the setup. And Georgia? So I kind of think for, for me personally, a scene ideally progresses plot, progresses character, world building and vibes. But I also think the way this can be conveyed could literally be like a couple of sentences or like pages and pages. Um, and I guess I would say like some scenes are maybe like tilted in favor of some of those elements more than others. Um, but for me, it's sort of really about making sure everything serves the story as fully as possible. And I'm kind of squeezing the most out of what I'm writing. Alex, your turn. Yeah, I, I agree with Heather in that I don't think there has to be any hard and fast rules, especially sci-fi and fantasy. One reason why, why I like writing in this genre. Um, for me personally, I, I think um, progressing the plot is important. Um, I like to write things that are kind of have, have a good pace uh, and keeping that pace. So that's important. Um, stakes, uh, whether low or, or high stakes, I think having some element of stakes, whether it be through dialogue or action, is important. And then vibes, uh, as Georgia said, I think vibes um, in general, just like if, if, if I write something and, and the scene has is just very dry um, without giving any sort of vibes like nostalgia or or, you know, uh, something that's making your heart race or whatever it might be, then I, I try to work work through that. So my next question is specifically about the structure of a scene. Do you use any sort of standard scene structure? Uh, some examples I've seen are making sure that a scene has a distinct beginning, middle, and end, making sure that it contributes to both plot and character development, having an individual scene arc that sort of parallels the overall book arc. Uh, do you use any of those or is it more organic? Uh, let's start with Georgia this time around. So I wish I could be a bit more articulate about this, but to be honest, I just kind of want it to feel like story shaped. Um, you know, I sometimes use scenes are ten, you know, sort of very short and are really there to convey like a single element of story very strongly. So, you know, something might be really heavy on atmosphere and world building and then very light on plot and character. Um, but then I think, you know, the longer scenes that are sort of more complex where I'm juggling like a lot of different threads, I think for me, you know, I tend to ask myself a lot of questions and give myself a lot more notes beforehand um or or, or alternatively give myself notes afterwards that I can then go back and work on so I know I'm not dropping anything it's a good point that sometimes the shape of a scene is going to come out of the the rewrite rather than the initial write uh Kim why don't you go next since you talked about scenes as as building up to a punchline how does that work <laughs> in terms of the the structure um I do love a good callback like there's a story trick where if you go into a house and you see a sword on the wall, at some point you're going to have to pick up that sword and use it. So if I'm just starting off a scene like that, maybe they walk in and they're talking to a big bad and they notice that there's a sword within striking distance. And so maybe the scene ends when they grab it and foist it at the other guy's neck. And you can even just end it right there in that cliffhanger because that'll set you up for a whole new scene of action. It's making sure that all the all the Chekhov swords have been picked up by the end of the scene. Yeah. Heather, what do you think? Yeah, I think that uh, maybe a bit like Georgia, I kind of struggled a bit with answering this question. Um, I think for me, it's because I don't usually think of scenes that much when I'm writing. Um, like in terms of when I think of kind of like the elementary particles of my novel, I actually think about plot beats. Not really. I don't think about scenes. And so... For me, generally, when I'm outlining my novel, because I'm a planter, so like I have a rough outline, but not nothing super detailed, um, I might come up with like 10 or 12 plot beats. And then I, for each one, I just kind of sit and, you know, stare up into space for a while and kind of try to visualize the structure of what that beat should be. And sometimes it's one scene, sometimes it could be several scenes, but kind of the plot beat is the 
what I think of when in terms of advance, advancing the story and advancing the characterization, that's kind of what a plot beat is. It's kind of inherent in that concept. And so I don't really worry about each individual scene advancing the character, advancing the plot, just as long as the overall plot beat is doing that for me, then, you know, that's fine. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that distinction between plot beats and scenes. That's a good point. Um, Alex, how about you? What What is your scene structure? Yes, I, I so I, first of all, I, I do mostly discovery writing, pantsing. Um, so during the drafts, there's very little organization. It's, it's fairly chaotic. Um, a lot of it comes together in the edits. Um, but even, even then, I think uh, what I look for is how the scene sits, uh, sits between other scenes. And so uh, what I, you know, sometimes I run into the problem where actually my scenes, as far as having a beginning, middle, and end, and, and being fairly structured, if, if there's multiple scenes like that that are sitting next to each other, it feels fairly unnatural, like almost trying too hard. So, you know, oftentimes it works out organically that there's a pretty natural beginning, middle, and end, and, and kind of something that a unifying theme that tie, ties the scene together, which is really nice when that happens. But um, I think, you know, that really needs to be uh, almost not, not the norm to some extent, because it, it feels a bit unnatural for me, at least. So some of you already answered at least part of one of my other questions, which was about how much preparation you do before writing a particular scene. You know, have you plotted out which story beats you're going to hit? Do you just have a vague idea of where you're heading? Um, Heather, you mentioned that you're a, a planter. Uh, Alex, you said you're a bit more of a, a pantser. Uh, does anyone have other thoughts to offer on the preparation you do before you start writing a scene? Too chaotic, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I don't write chronologically, so it's just like it's it's just like lots and lots of documents with three three lines of dialogue and then a blank space um, for future Georgia to worry about. That's really interesting. I'm always fascinated by the authors that don't write chronologically. I find that impossible to do myself. It's like the magic trick or something. But yeah, for me, I do need to write in order. Um, and, you know, like I said, I don't necessarily pay attention to the ind individual scenes, but I think like Alex was saying, I do pay attention to kind of the, the shape of the story. And if there's a bunch of scenes, like you kind of have to pay attention to that in terms of like the length of scenes. Um, so one of the strategies that I use is I might use like shorter scenes and I'm trying to move the pace along and to, you know, create that kind of page turner effect. So near the climax of a story, for example, I might use that. But longer scenes can also be really good for kind of getting readers to sort of settle in and kind of feel at home in a story. So for me, it just really depends on what kind of effect I'm trying to go for at a particular moment in the story. Yeah, similar to what, what Heather said, as well as what I'd said before, is I think uh, I, I try to shape the scene based on where it is exactly, uh, you know, moving towards the end. If I'm really trying to increase the pace, uh, I'll do shorter scenes. Um, and it also depends on the POV. If I'm writing multiple POVs, I think the scene really uh, needs to needs to fit with the character. Will it be in a more abrupt? You know, that will fit with the character as well. So, All right, great. So we've been talking about scenes more generally, but part of the reason that we brought the four of you together is, as I mentioned earlier, that you write some of the same kinds of scenes, but I think you're you're each sort of specialist in a particular kind of scene that I wanted to talk about today. Um, so I want to talk about how those specific kinds of scenes, how the ideas about scene construction in general play out. If we've talked about, you know, story advancement being key to a scene, how does that play out in different kinds of scenes? Heather, I'm going to start with you because I find epistolary books fascinating. And I'm really curious how you tackle the sort of distance that comes from, you know, a character is always talking about something after it happens, essentially, in, in epistolary. How, do, how does the idea of scene advancement play out? How do you construct an epistolary scene specifically? Mm. Yeah, I love that question because it gives me an opportunity to complain about epistolary novels and how hard they are to write. <laughs> um, because I didn't actually initially write Emily Wall as an epistolary novel. I was just going to do first person, which is honestly what I usually do. Um, but then a few pages in, I was kind of like, okay, no, she's actually writing in her journal that this is epistolary. Well, that's fine. It's just going to be like first person. <laughs> and it, of course it isn't. It's an entirely different beast. And um, it is a struggle because 
I actually find that when you're crafting a scene, there's often, it's almost like the epistolary structure is antithetical to some of the techniques and strategies that you normally would go to as an author. So like one example is kind of the idea of a cliffhanger ending at the end of a scene, which of course is, you know, everyone uses that. It's great. It keeps the pace going. Readers, you know, are hooked. They keep reading. But you can't really do that in a epistolary. Like there's some kind of workarounds where you can be like, oh, she got interrupted in the middle of it. But in general, if you're sitting down at the end of the day to write a journal entry, you're not going to stop writing in the middle of like a fight scene, right? So there are certain strategies that are kind of closed off to you and you kind of have to adapt, which is an interesting challenge. Um, you know, like there are some workarounds, like I tried to do it um, to try to focus on the characterization of it. So like to give Emily... Emily Wilde, the protagonist, a reason to have like multiple journal entries for a single day. So she's like, she's just the type of person that loves to write in her journal. That kind of made sense for her as a character. Also, in terms of just like packing in a lot of stuff, I really struggled with that. So like one journal entry or one scene, if it covers a single day, there might be a lot happening and there might be like multiple scenes that have to be kind of folded into one kind of container, which can be really awkward. And so I had to kind of think about timing and pacing and kind of like spreading the scenes over a longer period of time to kind of, you know, get around that a little bit. Um, but it was a challenge. I will say, though, that I think that in terms of like characterization, how you build character within scenes, I do think that an epistolary structure is really conducive to that because there is no closer POV really than the epistolary structure. You're literally inside the character's head the whole time. So you're constantly asking yourself, would this character notice this detail? Would they even be describing this thing? Which can be really interesting in terms of giving you some insights into who that character is that might be closed off to you under their POVs. But yeah, in general, epistolary novels, they're, such, they're, su they're a struggle for me. I do them, but I struggle. <laughs> Yeah, we had an earlier panel about POV and one of the questions that came up was how you communicate something to the audience that the, the first person uh, narrator doesn't know. And it seems like that's even more of a problem with epistolary scenes. Um, so Kim and Alex, sex scenes and fight scenes actually I think have quite a bit in common. Um, in, in both cases, you're trying to transcribe something that is about where physical body parts are going uh, in a way that might be a little bit awkward. And I think both of those are types of scenes that sometimes people say, you know, this is not really needed. It's just gratuitous sex. It's just gratuitous action. Um, so I want to talk to the two of you next about scenes. Kim, why don't why don't we start with you? There there are plenty of sex scenes in the Mead Mishap series. <laughs> Spoilers, I guess, a little bit. Um, how do you think of things like character development, plot development during sex scenes? Is it is it kind of you know, a break from the rest of the book? Is it is it very intrinsic to the rest of the book? What's your sort of philosophy on those scenes? I would say it's very intrinsic to the rest of the book because I feel like the best sex scenes started well before anyone takes their clothes off. It's about the tension and figuring out what your character is thinking in that moment. Like, for example, in That Time I Got Drunk and Saved the Demon, the first real, not even like full sex scene happens when Cinnamon is still very unsure of herself and her attraction to Fallon. And so... What he's doing is basically reassuring her like, no, 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 it is okay for you to want this. Those inhibitions in your head are lies. It's cool. Let's take our clothes off. And I know it may seem silly, but she needs that moment to like break down her walls. And by the end of it, she still doesn't fully trust or believe in this mission, but they are, she went from being tensed and not sure of herself to joking and laughing with him. And it just really was a nice, sweet and sexy moment to move their relationship forward. And I think in sex scenes, you have to be willing to get vulnerable with your characters and really take the time to explore what they're thinking and not just what they're feeling. And on that note, close your eyes and remember you have other senses. Use all of them as sex scenes. Don't be afraid to just do a liquid shot of courage if you need it. Sex is natural and it's fun. And one thing I should mention is that I would focus on like just not getting in and out of the sex scene, really take time to think how would they react to this? For example, one of my characters, Cherry, is a virgin. So at some point she's thinking like, oh, what do I do with my hands? Is this the right way to do things? I don't know. Meanwhile, I have more confident characters who are just like, this is what I like. Here's what I like to do next. And we move. 
So Alex, let's talk about fight scenes. As I said, there's there's some sort of physical movement that needs to be conveyed to the page in, in a similar way that can be tricky. How do you figure out, you know, who is at what point in the in the chapter, who is physically, you know, where on the sort of stage? Do you ever get up and, and act out the fight scenes yourself? How do you approach writing a fight scene? Yeah, actually, what based on what Kimberly was saying just now, there there are a lot of similarities between fight scenes and sex scenes. But um, to step back, uh, you know, be prior to the fight scene, I think that's just like prior to a sex scene. I think building a lot of the tension uh, before any combatants or any any battles start, I think, is so important. Um, just setting it up, whether it be you know what their uh, character's training might be or what they're going through prior to that, which really end of the day sets up stakes. Um, and it, like any scene, dialogue, sex, whatever it might be, a fight scene that's just the bare descriptions of, of the action um, without without the stakes, without those prior, again, um, setting it up in, in the proper way uh, will really come off dry. And then as far as the you know physical presence of the characters in the fight scene, there's a lot of different things I like to do, do to try to keep the rhythm. Um, you know, you can make the mistake of going on one end of the spectrum, which is being far too detailed, um, which again can come off dry. And then the other action, end of the action, um, you know, being too sparse and then your readers not being able to picture where the characters are in physical space. I think I like to, uh, again, back to what Kimberly said, um, use a lot of other senses um, to, to uh, I write in third person primarily. So being able to uh, head hop a little bit, not, not in an omniscient way, but, you know, gauge the reaction of, of the crowd, um, gauge, you know, if there's other people watching, um, getting getting their response to it, um, I think will really uh, increase the stakes. Great. Okay, Georgia, it's your turn. Uh, so death scenes happen in a lot of books, especially I think in science fiction and fantasy, but there, there are a number of notable and memorable sex, not sex scenes, sorry, death scenes in the city of Stardust. Can you talk a bit about how you put those together and how you make them dramatic without being melodramatic, uh, individual to each character and memorable? Yes, I did think I was writing a lighter book until I started seeing people say, wow, this is really dark. You know, you kill a lot of people. Um, I do, but in a magical way. So I hope that's, hope that's okay. Um, I mean, with death scenes, I kind of, uh, for me, I really like to consider the context first and foremost. Um, like, what emotion do I want to elicit from the reader? Is it supposed to be shocking? Is it supposed to feel inevitable? Is it supposed to feel triumphant or bittersweet? Um, and I think that's true of all scenes, but I just think because death is such a big concept, um, that's kind of something I like to consider. Like, I, I'm sure we all have, like, that one death scene from that one book um, that broke us forever. Uh, I know which book mine is. Um, and then I think it's about sort of trying to work it in um, and work it into the whole of the book. Like, I, even if it's supposed to be, like, a shocking or surprising death, I really like to try and go back and seed in hints earlier so, you know, if you're a close reader and you're rereading, you can kind of pick up on all these threads on a more conscious level. But hopefully as a first time reader, they're still all kind of subconsciously there and it feels both surprising and expected, um, which is, a, I feel like a tall order for, for a writer. Um, and I also just think, you know, it's a big moment, especially if you're removing like a major character from the novel. So it's just kind of looking for a way to get sort of maximum impact of reaction. It's a good point about things being both surprising and expected. I think that's a general principle for writing, but that's both hard and critical. Uh, does anyone have thoughts about uh, the other kinds of scenes that, that your fellow panelists have talked about? I know that there are sex scenes in books other than Kim's and death scenes in books other than Georgia's. Anyone have any thoughts to offer? Doesn't sound like it. All right. Um, uh, oh, go ahead. Just a, maybe a quick note on the fight scenes one. Um, I like the the strategy of focusing on the five senses. Um, I don't know that I necessarily do that because I struggle a bit with fight scenes, um, but I definitely do try to kind of create a bit of a map in my head for how the characters are going to move and kind of the landscape that they're that they're working with. Like the topography is really important in the few fight scenes that I've written. I try to have the in topography kind of interesting and kind of interact and interfere with the fight in some ways. So that's just a strategy that I've used. But yeah, fight scenes are not really my strong point. <laughs> 
You muted, Alex. Yeah, on the same, you know, flip side of the coin, I've been trying to write not an epistolary scene, but just something that's framed um, in a similar way, like uh, essentially a character POV through an interrogation, um, which is, I'm running into a lot of problems. So I think some of the, the techniques uh, through an epistolary scene could be could be very useful. <laughs> One thing I like to add to fight scenes that also works in sex scenes is thinking about the speed at which you're writing. For example, in the beginning of a fight scene, I like to build up the tension. Maybe she notices what armor they're wearing, what weapons they have. But then once they get to the actual fighting, I'm not detailing every little shine of the sword. It's swing, cut, slash, dialogue, swing, cut, slash, and then a quick finale if we want it like that. Or maybe drag that part in for some more dialogue. But speed definitely matters. I wish I had something really useful to add, except that I think all of these things are hard to do. And I think part of part of, I guess, growing as a writer is sort of looking at how how your favorite writers do it and trying to see what tools they're using, um, because I have definitely struggled with all of these things. So speaking of struggling, uh, I have one more question before we move over to the audience questions. There are a lot there. Um, what do you do when you are struggling to get down a scene? Do you skip ahead? I think some of you have said already that you, you write out of order. So maybe you skip ahead and write the next scene. Uh, do you have any other tips for when, when a scene is, is uh, something you're struggling to get on paper? Go for a um, walk. Yeah. Just get up and leave. Anyway. I like the bracket. I like the bracket things, especially descriptions. Like I hate, I really hate writing just descriptions or people traveling and this is less action scene related to traveling from one spot to another which oftentimes you don't even need so i'll just i'll just bracket it and write traveled or generic description <laughs> i find that for me generally if i'm struggling to write a scene um one of the main reasons is that i'm trying to make the character do something that isn't actually natural to them. I'm trying to make them do something for plot reasons to kind of, I want the plot to go from here to here. And so I'm just like, okay, character, do, do this to get there. But it's not something that they would actually do. So in those, in those instances, it's about sort of stepping back and asking myself how I can make that scene more, um, more character focused rather than plot focused. Um, and even if that means throwing a wrench into the, the tidy little plot that I had in mind, sometimes that's a good thing because sometimes messiness is fun and sometimes it can create these unexpected um, moments in a story that can be just really entertaining. Um, I cry. No, I think about crying. Um, and then I kind of go back and work it out really slowly. It's usually when I'm struggling, it's because of logic problems or plot problems, kind of like how to move um, from sort of like A to B while I'm juggling a lot of different story threads. Um, I also really like to follow this advice by Lainey Taylor, uh, which is like, what's the coolest thing that can happen here? And sometimes just brainstorming that is really, really useful because sometimes the scene I'm writing is in fact the wrong scene and something else needs to happen. All right, let's move over to the audience questions. There are some really good ones in here. Uh, starting off with a question from Malcolm, who asks, can you describe some times when you realized a scene was going on too long and what you did to salvage it? Did you switch perspectives, cut something, or was there something else that you did that you think was helpful? Whoever wants to jump in, go ahead. I just, Amet, uh, put in a dramatic cutoff. Like, usually I'll rearrange the scene where I can have some sort of cliffhanger that would lead me to the next one. So I actually just uh, did a bunch of this because I've just handed in the draft of my next book. Um, and what usually if I feel like it's going on too long, I just cut everything out and everything that's like I, I like when it gets boring and then I stick it together with the chapter that comes after it. And all of a sudden there's so many things happening um, in the chapter. And actually, it's been really, really helpful in terms of pacing. I find that often um, when a scene is going on too long, it's actually when I step back and think about it, it's actually not necessary for that scene to be as long as it is. And actually I can kind of cut myself off if I need to and kind of go back and, and take out some of the stuff that is actually extraneous. Sometimes you don't realize that what you're doing is just kind of rambling or just putting in a lot of extraneous information. And when you kind of step back and look at it more critically, you can, 
you know, terminate the scene in a way that is logical. Yeah, I, I agree. I think a lot of that, especially in drafting, uh, because you're, you're just trying to get words on the page, essentially, there there is a ton of extraneous information. And once you have your, your full draft and you get into edits, you realize that a lot of that information, uh, narrative, character development, whatever it is, has been conveyed in, through other scenes, or, or as you said, it hasn't, doesn't need to be conveyed at all. So I agree. The next question is from Sierra, and this one is is a little general and sort of taking taking a step back from individual scenes and, and into putting them together. Uh, how do you best use and write scenes to help move the story between each major plot point? Heather, you're muted. All right, I was I was actually just mumbling to myself. Um, <laughs> But um, sorry, what, the question popped. It went away again. Where, what was it? Could you repeat it? The question is about writing scenes to move the story between major plot points. So more about the general right. structure of, of the novel and how you use scenes to create that. Yeah. So again, um, because I don't really think in terms of scenes, um, this question, um, I feel like if you think about the story in terms of plot beats, this question almost doesn't become a problem anymore because you have the kind of um, that kind of underpainting, I guess, of the story already set out. And the scenes just become kind of a way to sort of break up different plot beats that you've already figured out for yourself. So yeah, I, I don't know, maybe taking a step back and looking at it from that kind of the higher level would be helpful. Yeah, I agree with Heather. Um... But I also, that's also one reason why I don't write chronologically. Um, because if I kind of know my, like, my main, my main beats or kind of like where I want, like my really big scenes to go, I can kind of flesh those out first and then kind of go back in and see how I can connect the dots um, with the rest of the story threads along the way. Any other thoughts on this, Alex or Kim? Um, I think I'm a little bit different with how I think about the story, just because in my mind, I'm throwing fireballs at a character to see how they react. And so throughout the story, I'm sort of just tossing different wild situations, just so I can laugh at basically the character dancing around the flames. So whenever I feel like they've had enough, I'll put in a scene for them to get a break or whatever feels natural. If this is when they maybe start to give in to their partner, I put that scene in and then we just keep hurling fireballs to see what would happen. And when I don't know what I'm doing, I toss another fireball just to see what would happen. Yeah, um, similar to what Heather had said earlier, I really, when I'm, when I'm in draft, my drafting brain is completely different like most people's versus editing brain. Um, so when I'm drafting, I really try to rely on the characters. Um, I know that when I'm trying too hard to connect narrative or plot, points um it just comes off fairly unnaturally so i try to go back to the character um and see what what they really would do um when i'm discovery writing and then during edits uh i'm looking more for obviously the plot points have to be co coherent um but i'm more looking for rhythm um, and pace okay the next question comes from donegal who says how do you deviate the manner in which your scenes end? I've gone back through some of my old writing and noticed a lot of my scenes start with a character waking up or starting the day and a lot end with a character physically departing or going to sleep or ending the, their day. Uh, so how do you deviate how scenes start and end? I try to, I try to um, look at a lot of stuff through uh, as kind of a, a camera lens almost. I picture a lot of my scenes as if they were were movies or you know cinema, um, TV, and if you notice a lot, if you're a lot of shows will you know cut in and out in the middle of scenes. I think that's entirely a great. I think that's a great way to do it. <laughs> Again, it comes off. It seems more natural um, if, if the if the information of the character waking up and whatever that in, in this example waking up and the process of them getting out of bed and brushing their teeth if that's integral to the plot or the character development and you're going to learn something about the character based on what they're doing though during those initial moments again in this example waking up 
then that's important. But otherwise, I think it's fine to just like fade fade the black early or or you know fade fade into the scene early. I yeah, definitely I agree. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was just gonna say I agree with that, and that's my strategy too. You can just kind of lop off the beginning or lop off the end of a scene and just start it a little bit later. But I just also wanted to chime in and say, I've had that exact same thing. I actually, my most recent middle grade book, my editor pointed out that like four of my scenes started off with the character waking up. So like, this is something that like all authors struggle with and it's okay. Um, but it's good that you're conscious of it because some people like me sometimes aren't even conscious of it. So I think that's, you're a little bit ahead there already, so. I definitely agree with that. One point I would just like to add is that I often look at my scenes like I'm writing a sitcom where if I left on a snappy dialogue the next time, maybe I'll just cut in the middle of a scene next or maybe the end of the next scene is when another fireball shows up. So just try to keep it as not random, but as diverse as I can. I think paraphrasing as well as like your best friend, like if you know something needs to happen, like if you know, like, for example, they need to go on a car journey to get from A to B, you can't just say they got in the car and three hours later they arrived. Um, and uh, oh, I completely forgot what I was going to say. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the thing. Oh, the other thing that was really helpful, and it is, it's a little bit more setting based, but I think if you're using like a similar setting over the course of a book, it's really helpful with kind of these scene transitions, especially if they're similar is thinking about, and I don't know who said this, but flicking the lights on and off. There's, a, there's, a, there's an author who said, you know, if you're in a room and you have the lights on the first time, the next time you go into the room in the book, the light should be off and then you get a different vibe, um, which I think is also really helpful to consider. I just wanted to add, I really liked what Georgia said about paraphrasing. I think that sometimes that kind of dichotomy between showing and telling and how we always have to be showing and we shouldn't ever be telling is overstated. I think that telling is sometimes just a really effective way of moving the story forward and can create more variety in the story. So like give yourself permission to like sometimes tell you don't always have to be showing. That's a really just good add one additional thing. I think often when I first started uh, writing, I think you underestimate uh, readers' abilities to fill in the blanks, um, especially like in the midway point through the book. Of course, when you first start the book, you you have to provide sufficient detail, especially in sci-fi fantasy, world building, etc. But once you get into the the thick of it, I think you really can rely on your readers um, being readers and and doing what they do, which is filling filling in a lot of the blanks and not having to provide too many extraneous details, including the beginning and the end. Okay, next up, Madison asks, how do you make filler scenes interesting? You add dinosaurs. <laughs> really, I'll just, sometimes I will just walk around and the first thought that pops into my head, swords, ninjas, dinosaurs, boom, there we go. Now it's not boring. I don't think I yeah, I try not to have filler scenes. I mean, I think I think everything should serve the story. I think everything should serve the story. And if it isn't serving the story, it has to go. And it's a shame because there are some there are some scenes that I loved. That I was so desperate to keep, but they were filler scenes and I had to let go of them. Um, but I have kept them in a secret folder uh, to repurpose where they will serve the story. Um, but I do think you could have like pause scenes where, you know, characters are kind of like have like a really intense action moment and now they're sitting down and kind of taking stock. And I guess that's sort of like, like an active filler scene, if that makes sense. Um, but then it should always be doing something. It should sort of be moving character development, moving plot in a different way. Maybe it should be like very vibey and very world building instead. Um, I think having that level of variation um, is sometimes really interesting for the reader. Yeah, I think that I agree with that. Maybe the maybe the the phrase filler scene, maybe what is actually being referred to are those sort of more slower contemplative scenes where it's just a char two characters kind of sitting in a room and talking. Um, and I think those scenes are really important, like Georgia said. I think that you need variety in terms of like the texture of sort of the pacing of the story um, in order for it to feel really immersive. So I wouldn't necessarily, like if your filler scene is truly a filler scene, I would say, yes, get rid of it. Um, if there's something that you're doing in there, see if you can extract that one detail or that one kind of plot point that you're trying to work into that filler scene and put it somewhere else. 
But if it's a, not really a filler scene, if it's more just a slower moving kind of scene that maybe is good for it to be there at that point in the story, then yeah, don't worry too much about it because that can bring a lot um, to a book as well. Yeah, I don't, I don't have much to add. I, I agree with everything they've said. Uh, I wouldn't, I, again, I think filler scene, if it is the word filler, then it makes me want to cut the scene. But I think maybe what they're referring to could be just scenes that are at a different pace, something at a slower pace. Like if I'm having a, a I don't want to put multiple action scenes, um, you know, necessarily together. I want to put some, some slower scenes, uh, more dialogue, more character development in between. Allie asks, how do you determine the correct place to start a scene? You know, I've talked about lopping off the beginning, lopping off the end. Let's let's make this, how do you determine where to start and where to end a scene? If you have any additional thoughts on that. Start where it's interesting. Nobody cares about your character waking up and brushing their hair. Maybe what happens after they brush their hair? Is that when, I don't know, the ninja shows up? Start when the ninja shows up. Yeah, I completely agree with Kimberly. Um, I think that one of the most important questions you can kind of ask yourself is um, what kind of story do I want to be telling? I think that when we tell stories that are the stories that we would want to read and in the way that we would want to read them, and when we're kind of regularly asking ourselves that question, like what would I like to see happen next if I was reading this book? I think that that's when we kind of know intuitively where we should start the next scene. Anyone else? Yeah, I agree. I think I think sometimes it is very hard, though. Um, so sometimes I think if you're first drafting, I think it's fine to just start like where it's easiest, and then I think later on, like maybe maybe you've like gotten like your word like your initial words out, and then you can kind of like cut the beginning and go to like where you got really excited or where stuff starts to happen. Um, I mean, I've definitely I've definitely had to do that a couple of times. Okay, there are a couple of questions about how scenes relate to chapters. Uh, the first one is, is on the general side. What's the relationship between scenes and chapters? Is it a length? Is it just what feels right? How many scenes are there per chapter? Or, or is a chapter or is a scene sometimes made up of multiple chapters? Yeah, I think I think all of that, uh, because I've run into, you know, wanting to go crazy thinking about thinking about these details of what the difference between scenes and chapters, but um, I think that's all editing. Uh, that's all for the editing. I really try not to worry about any of that uh, during drafting. Um, I'll make a little, you know, dash or a star. I won't even necessarily think about what the chapters are at that point. And a lot of that, uh, a lot of those dominoes will fall when I'm when I'm in editing. Real quick, Heather, if you don't show the chat that cat, there might be a riot. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll see. She's going to protest. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> she um, likes to interfere a lot. Um, so, sorry about that. <laughs> That's just Artemis. Um, she thinks that I'm losing my mind if I sit and talk too long to a computer screen and there's no one else in the room. Um, but yeah, I agree with what Alex was saying um, in terms of like, I, I really like to have shorter chapters if I can. Um, and so there might be fewer scenes within each chapter. Um, I just think that that keeps the reader moving along at a nice pace. Um, but if it's unavoidable, then yeah, I will have multiple scenes. I try not to worry about word count in a chapter unless it's like ridiculously long. But yeah, whatever feels right in that moment is just what I do. It's fine if some chapters are short. It's fine if some are long. I wouldn't make it like, I don't know, over 10,000 words, but I don't tend to have like super long chapters anyway. So I definitely think it, it can be really fun to play with form. Um, I know that I know sometimes it's a bit of a marmite kind of uh, reading experience. Um, I definitely have a couple of chapters where I think of them as like my montage chapters because you get like different different sort of points of view from like, an, but you've got, but it's sort of told by an overarching um, narrator. Um, and that can be, I think that can be really, really fun. And again, it's one of those kind of like short vibey chapters that sort of, doing one thing very strongly um, rather than trying to do too much. I think, but I think, you know, when I'm sort of in like what I think of as like my regular chapters, I try and stick to like 
maybe one or two scenes um just because i think that sort of being able to drill down and focus on the moment is really important Uh, there's a question about how you all plan your scenes when you outline, but I but I think most of you are not outliners. Am I correct in that? Does anyone outline? Okay, we're going to skip that question. Then. Um, let's do this one. Uh, this is also a bit about chapters, um, but I think this could apply to scenes as well. Is it okay to have a chapter or scene jump between storylines if it's still connected by theme, or do you keep to one storyline per chapter or scene? I tend to keep to one storyline per chapter unless it's like they're meeting up, if that makes sense. So if it's two plot points finally coming together, then I'll hop around. But otherwise, I tend to like to keep it consistent. I'll definitely, I'll definitely, I guess it depends on what I kind of define as storyline, like as I said before, like I will do those montage scenes, which I, re I really enjoy doing because they're so much fun. Um, but even though they're kind of, I guess, coming from different characters and different angles, the overarching storyline should be all pushing in one direction. So at least that way, it's sort of, you know, even if the, even if the structure is a bit more complex, um, the through line is very simple. Uh, I think it's about expectations of that you set from the start so if you're if you're doing a single pov per chapter and then you break that rule it's going to be jarring for readers but if you're throughout the entire story jumping between multiple povs within a chapter then i think readers will will become used to that This question is a bit off topic, but it's an interesting one that relates to what we've been talking about. Kristen asks, does anyone reverse outline, as in outline what you've already written? Oh, yeah, I do that. But that's because I've made usually made such a hash of, of usually like the first time I'm doing things, I've usually made quite a big hash of like the logic. Um, so I kind of have to go back and tell myself what I've done um, because I can't really move forward if I if I don't or I can't really fix it if I don't. Yeah, I do that. I do that as well. Um, usually, bef like after I finish a draft, before I send it to anyone, to let anyone see the mess that it is, um, I will go through and I'll do like a summary. Usually, I'll actually use post-it notes, and I will have like each major plot point or plot beat on a post-it note, and then I'll kind of stick them all up on the wall. And that kind of is a really good way for me to visualize the entire story at a single glance, which I find really helpful. And it gives you a really solid sense of the overall structure and how the different scenes are working together. And that's also a really easy way where you can kind of be like, okay, well, I'm not sure I like the pacing here. Maybe I can swap things around. Um, so yeah, that's just a fun little technique that I've used. Hey, Jenna asks, how do you decide on and structure your beginning and ending scenes for the entire novel? So I can't speak on the endings. If you ask my readers, I'll tell you I cannot write an ending. However, I love starting off with like a quotable thing because when I was in college uh, getting my animation degree, one of the things that they always told us is that you want to start strong. If you can't hook your reader in like the first five minutes of your end of your show, of your book or whatever, they're going to go. So I'll usually start off with something funny. Like uh, I think the first line in this book is I had two things on my mind, cheese and how to get home. And anything that's really just going to grab your reader's attention, that's where I'll start. Yeah, I agree with that. I kind of do the same thing because for me, I like to... Um... I like for my stories to be fun for me to write. And so I kind of, I like having something fun to kind of start the story off with. So usually the opening lines of each of my books are, they don't actually change. I think I've kept almost all of my opening lines because it's just almost like if I can come up with that kind of fun sort of intro, then that motivates me to keep going and to sort of see the process as this kind of fun, more playful process rather than as something super serious, this huge task of writing this massive book. 
So yeah, it's good motivation as well as I think something that's fun for readers. Yeah, I agree. I definitely, I usually know my beginning and mostly my ending by the time I start writing. Um, usually just because that's that's kind of where the idea hits. Um, and I have usually by, I think by like, maybe if I'm like two thirds or roughly sort of halfway into the book, I've usually already written the ending. Um, because I, I really like books to feel, um, to feel like circular. Um, I think there's something very satisfying and fairy tale like um, about that. Uh, this this is, sounds fairly common sense, but depending on which book, especially for a series, uh, as far as endings go, I try to look for obviously tying up loose loose ends, not loose ends, but tying up. Uh, narrative the various narratives as well as if it's a if it's first book leading to a second i want to provide some sort of cliffhanger and you know a lead into the next book right, we have a question from maya uh this is addressed to heather but i think this is something all of you could answer maya says heather i really admire the way you write high tension high action scenes I tend to get the most self-aware writing those kinds of scenes. However, I tend to see myself thinking on the page. Do you have any strategies for getting out of your head and back into the narrators in that kind of high tension scene, either in the process of writing or after coming back to revise? That's a really good question. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of a bigger question too, a bigger problem getting outside of your own head. For me, I mean, I just kind of I guess I alluded to this a bit before, but I really like to try to think of the novel writing process as like play, like the, the initial draft, revisions are not played, all revisions are tough. <laughs> For me anyway, they're a slog. But if you can kind of try to have fun with what you're writing and to really kind of, if you can, like it's hard to, to do this, it's easier said than done, but if you cannot take the scene too seriously and just kind of focus on like, I think it would be cool if this happened and then write that thing, you're going to find it's a lot easier to kind of get outside of your own head a little bit. Does anyone else have thoughts on this question? Okay. Uh, we have a little bit of an existential question from Christina. We've been talking about scenes as well as plot beats. And Christina asks, what is the distinction between a plot beat and a scene? I guess I'm the one that's been using that term all the time. So maybe I should um, answer first. For me, a plot beat is just like, a major kind of key component of the story that moves the story forward in some way. So a plot beat for Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies, um, maybe not to give spoilers, just like the initial plot beat would be something like Emily arrives in the village and settles in, like that's that plot beat. So that will probably involve several different scenes, right? There's Emily kind of getting off the boat, getting to the cottage. There's Emily having a conversation with one of the villagers. There's her kind of afterwards sort of sitting by herself by the fire. Um, so that will all be encompassed within that one plot beat. Hopefully that's helpful. <laughs> Does anyone else have thoughts on the difference between scenes and, and pieces of the plot? I think they pretty much covered it. Yeah. All right, great. That's the answer. Um, let's see. We're getting through a lot of a lot of these questions, which is great. Um, how do you keep track of the small details in a scene so that you can make sure you keep them integrated from scene to scene, like setting details or clothing or physical conditions? Oh, I am a huge fan of keeping a book Bible. Like I don't really write with Scrivener. However, it's great for keeping things in order. So any kind of instance, even if it's just like hair color or equipment, I have a page for each character in like every location that I've got and just jot down literally everything, even if I don't think it's important at a time, chances are I need to remember it like five chapters in the future. So having that book Bible has been just the best, especially if you're writing a series. Yeah, I, I probably should do that, Kimberly, like you, but <laughs> not so much. So I've relied heavily on my, my editors who've done a fantastic job. Um, it's kind of amazing. I've always marveled, especially uh, with this series, um, you know, with the, the how much world building there is among uh, amongst two or three books, what they're catching as far as 
you know, geographic terrain, uh, directionality of, of people, people that are, you know, which direction people are moving. So, um, yeah, I, I probably need to do a better job doing that. <laughs> Uh, this is why I don't write chronologically. It's one of the main reasons because if I'm like, if I've got like a motif that I want that I use in the beginning, um, and I've just done this sort of more recently, um, and then I'm like, oh, you know, I really like that, and I'd love it to come back in a different context. I'll then go and stick it in. Uh, I use Scrivener, and I'll go and stick it in a different document further down the line, and just write like this thing happens here, and then I'll have the dialogue piece. Um, but the things that I really struggle with um, are things like seasonality and time and how long is a year and what do people do in a year? Um, I've definitely, I think I'm definitely like that. Oh, you've had like three Mondays in a row uh, kind of writer. And um, I can only applaud those who get it right the first time because it was a lot more difficult than I thought it would be. Yeah, I also struggle with time. And I just wanted to second the idea of a series Bible. I also do that for my writing. It's invaluable because I have a terrible memory. I won't call them out uh, by name, but one of my favorite authors has a book where I think there are about eight weeks between the beginning of October and the end of October. And I've read this book so many times, I have it memorized by heart. So I noticed it. I don't know if anyone else did, but yeah, keeping track of time can be very tricky. Listen, time is an imaginary construct and I will not be bound to it. <laughs> especially in a fantasy novel, maybe October is exactly. eight weeks long. Who knows? Uh, so Georgia, I'm glad you mentioned Scrivener because there's been a lot of chat about Scrivener in the chat. Uh, and I'm wondering if there are other tools that you all use to keep track of your scenes, particularly because it sounds like most of you are not writing an outline ahead of time. So how do you move scenes around to get them into their final order or just any other tools that you use while writing? Um, I do kind of have an outline, but it's a, it's a rough outline. Um, mm -hmm. I, but I just use Microsoft Word. I don't use Scrivener. I'm not technologically adept enough for that. So yeah, I'm old fashioned. I just stick with Word. I'm a lunatic and still use Google Docs for the main draft. And because I can use Google Docs, I can just make a quick copy and just copy and paste chapters wherever you want. I know I'll eventually need to stop and give up Google Docs, but until Atticus lets me do the same things I can in that one, I will stick with it. I also use Google Docs, Kimberly, so yes. yes. <laughs> I'm, I, I, uh, my, it, I like send the emails to myself in the future that have notes and various email accounts. It's, it's crazy. I don't know. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, I think. I, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. I'm just a big fan of. I'm a big fan of Scrivener, but I also recommend just using a notebook. I, I yell at myself a lot in my notebook, and that's kind of if I'm working working out things. That's where I'm writing down various obvious questions like, who is this person? What do they want? Um, and that's kind of my very non-technological tool. All right, I think we are pretty much at time. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you to the four of you for, for talking about scenes, a very important and yet also very abstract concept. Uh, I think several of you in the chat have mentioned that you're doing national novel writing this month, this month. Uh, good luck. And also our last session tomorrow is help. I need more words. So maybe some of you will want to attend that and uh, learn how to write more words. Um, click on that green button at the bottom of the screen to buy these authors books and, and sign up for that session or watch replays of past sessions. Uh, again, this event was recorded. So if you want to share it with any of your friends, you can send them the same link. It'll also be going up on the Orbit YouTube account very shortly. So you'll be able to share that link as well. Thank you again. Thanks to the four of you. This was this was a lot of fun. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.